Aside from being necessary for the sustenance of life, there is something intrinsically important and valuable about food and fellowship around food. When the early church would meet together, the Bible records that believers would share a meal together, breaking bread from house to house. Acts 2.46 says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. The Lord's Supper itself is also centered around the breaking of bread. We see in 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And so sharing meals together is associated with fellowship and communion, not only with each other, but also with the Lord himself. And so food is also listed as a source of blessing and a life-giving sustenance in the Bible. So the Bible places a lot of importance on food, on water, as basic necessities of life, and also speaks of them as blessings that God gives to his people. Look also at Deuteronomy 32, starting at verse 13. Speaking of his own people, Jacob, God says, he made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. And that's such a rich description of food as a blessing that God had given to his own people. Likewise, when David was seeking refuge from Saul, Abigail came to his aid with a generous food offering. We see that in 1 Samuel 25, 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn, and an hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on asses. Now this was before David took Abigail to be his wife, uh, but she came to him uh, and to his aid of he and his men with tons of scores of food as sustenance and blessing. But today we've taken what God intended as sustenance and a blessing and turns it into something unprecedented and dangerous. Food is such an important part of family, church, and fellowship, Yes, yet most churches somehow end up missing how important that fellowship around food really is, according to the Bible. In the old days, families would sit around the table to have meals together, with the father at the head of the table, the mother on the opposite side, and the children in between, representing the authority structures within that family. But today, families are often split apart, sometimes with both parents working different jobs, or maybe the TV takes the centerpiece at dinner time, or someone might be busy on their cell phone, or just, you know, they're not always, people aren't always eating together the way that we used to as families around the table. And everyone is in a hurry nowadays also. And so by design, we've become an artificial fast food GMO nation with little time to reflect on God, on family, or on neighbors, or on friends. And so what I want to preach about today is GMOs, Monsanto, and the importance of eating organic food. And for some reason, this issue has somehow been labeled a liberal cause for the lunatic fringe of society. Most Christians and conservatively minded people, when you bring up the words GMO or organic, will scoff at you and think that you're some kind of socialist, you know, hippie Obama or Bernie Sanders supporter, and you know, they just think you're nuts, basically, when you bring up this issue to the average Christian or to the average conservative. And that's why this issue isn't actually been preached a lot 
in church. I've actually never heard this sermon preached in church before. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm sure somebody has done it, but I, I've never heard it. And, you know, nothing can be further from the truth when it comes to this issue about how, you know, how it's perceived. Because Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's exactly what's happening within our food industry. Third John 1, 2 says, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. So that's the Apostle John speaking. So even the Apostle John placed some emphasis on physical health and not just spiritual health. Obviously, spiritual health is vastly more important, but he also placed emphasis on spiritual health. The Bible also calls our bodies the temple of the Holy Ghost in 1 Corinthians 6.19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And so it's our responsibility as Christians to be sure that we do not pollute God's temple with dangerous chemicals, harmful additives, or foreign substances that God never intended for our bodies to ingest. You know, any more than we should want to pollute our bodies with um, you know, cigarettes or chemical drugs or excessive alcohol, we should, we should want to have the same kind of consciousness about polluting our bodies with poisons, pesticides, unnatural preservatives, food coloring, and GMOs in our food. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1, starting at verse 11, and let's see what God has to say about GMOs. And yes, there really are but there really is a Bible verse, Bible verses about GMOs in the Bible. So look at Genesis 1. <clears throat> Genesis 1, starting at verse 11. And God said, <clears throat> Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. <clears throat> Pay attention to that phrase, whose seed is in itself. And in verse 12, And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So we see that God designed fruits and herbs, which here can also include vegetables, to have the seed in itself. That's how God made all the fruits, the vegetables, the herbs to contain the seed within itself for reproduction. And the Bible explains also that God made food good, just as it is. So there's no reason to tamper with food or to try to improve it or to try to modify it. Um, God saw that it was good. In Genesis 9, 3, God says also to Noah after the flood, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So God has collectively given to man all the animals and all the vegetation and everything that comes up out of the ground as food. So food and water is not just for one man or one company or one organization to own. The right of man to possess and to cultivate seed is protected and inalienable because God has given us that seed for food. So it collectively, that seed belongs to all of mankind, to everybody. Genesis 129, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a, of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. So God has given all of that to us as meat. And meat in the Bible means food, you know, because in the very beginning, uh, you know, they were just eating fruits and vegetables. And so that meat, biblically, that word means food itself. So God made the seed, God gave the seed to man, and God made the seed perfect. Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. 
But what's happened today is that there is a multi-billion dollar corporation named Monsanto. And Monsanto is arguably the most evil company in existence today. And I, and I really mean that the more you dig in and research what they're doing and how they're destroying farmers and, and what they're actually up to, they are, I believe they are literally among the most evil companies that we have seen in, in all of history to this, to this point. Now, Monsanto modifies seeds at the genetic level and then creates patents on those seeds and calls those seeds their intellectual property rights. Okay, so they are basically, they're attempting to own the seed in our food supply by altering it and then putting a patent on that seed. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they can keep their Frankenstein seeds because they're a monstrosity of creation, but the issue is that the GMO seeds can cross-pollinate and contaminate conventional seeds and non-GMO farms across the world. So these seeds naturally, when you have seeds next to each other on two plots of ground, one organic and one, one GMO, they're, they're gonna cross-pollinate. And so what ends up happening is they all become GMO eventually. Um, and so the potential there is that all seeds that we have in the world can eventually become GMO seeds and therefore the intellectual property of Monsanto Corporation. And that's when that happens, Monsanto has the potential of owning the world's, you know, the global food supply. And I believe that's by design. I don't think that's an accident. I believe that Monsanto knows exactly what they're doing. Um, you know, the good news is they don't have, every crop isn't GMO yet. So there's just, you know, the top crops right now that they're after. And so there's still room to fight this um, and for things to change potentially. But, you know, I believe that it's yet another factor in the end times New World Order scenario to control the food supply of, of the globe. But thank God that he says in his word in Genesis 8.22 that while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So as long as the earth is here, before Jesus comes back, that seed time and harvest is going to continue. That is not, Monsanto will not be successful in the end of controlling the world's food supply. Now they might get 80 to 90% of it, you know, but God is going to preserve um, a portion of conventional seed for his own people. And that's, that's what I believe based on that verse. You know, while we're here as Christians, God is gonna provide a remnant of those seeds and a remnant for his people to be able to eat you know, real food, organic food that has not been tampered with, food that God has made rather than Monsanto has made. So we can take comfort in that. Now, Monsanto Corporation formed in 1901 around the invention of saccharin, which is a known cancer-causing sweetener, you know, drug that people take and consume as a sugar substitute. Monsanto also manufactured Agent Orange, Okay, so they, are, they were producing Agent Orange during the Vietnam War, which then killed and injured millions of our Vietnam vets, as well as you know, millions of Vietnamese and caused hundreds of thousands of birth defects you know, because of that, that chemical drug that they were spraying. So this is the heritage of your food company right now. This is the, this is the company that's bringing you your food um, you know, through, their organ through their GMO seed. And Monsanto then made its mark as a pesticide company with their product Roundup, which is a chemical pesticide spray. And um, so that's, that's their big product that really you know, gave them their, their, their popularity. They became really huge at that point. They're also responsible for bovine growth hormone, which is a dangerous steroid injection for cows, which unnaturally increases milk production in those cows. So they can, you know, have the, you know, the udders of the cows just fill up with as much milk as possible um, through injecting them with this dangerous hormone. And that also causes mastitis and disease in those cows. So those cows 
then receive a dose of antibiotics to fight the diseases that they're getting from this artificial drug that they're getting injected with. And you know, so this is Monsanto, and Monsanto now provides us with our food. So this is a chemical company that's responsible for the world's you know, food supply and the crops that, that we're seeing come out of the, out of the nations, uh, most nations anyway. There's some, like, you know, some European nations that are a little bit wiser than we are who have banned GMO foods completely. Um, so it's, you know, it's straight out of 1984 by George Orwell. I mean, this is, this is the, the makers of Agent Orange, bovine growth hormone, um, taking our food and genetically modifying it. And this genetic modification of our food goes directly against God's natural order. Okay, God made the food a certain way. You know, so going against that, just like, you know, all the different ways that Satan is attacking God's creation and his natural order that we've talked about, this is just yet another front of the battle where Satan is modifying you know, God's creation to, to create something that's a defilement to God's order. So the modification of the seed itself is a defilement of what God has already made good. And placing patents on seeds is contrary to our God-given right to own seeds, especially when those alien seeds start contaminating our natural God-given seeds. Leviticus 19.19 says, ye shall keep my statutes, thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. And then pay attention to this, thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. So there is a direct verse in the Bible, and I realize this is Old Testament law in that verse, but the general principle still applies. You know, I wonder if there is a reason why God had that in there, you know, to apply to us even today. Deuteronomy 22.19 also says, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds. That's talking about you know, hybrid seeds and mixing seeds, which is exactly what GM, GMOs are. Lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard <clears throat> be defiled. The Bible says also that the fruit of mingled seeds are defiled. That's the same word that the Bible uses for rape. That's the first time the word defiled appears in the Bible. So it's like raping a seed structure at the genetic level. That's how strongly God feels about it. It's a defilement of his creation. The same way that a test tube baby with no parents or cloning a human being or genetically modifying DNA in humans for selective breeding is a defilement of God's natural order we're doing the same thing to our foods. <clears throat> and now, there's even talk of GMO babies, creating babies with three sets of parents through DNA and mitochondrial manipulation. So that's in the works. Um, it may already be happening as far as I know, but it's, or at least it's getting, you know, working on getting approved. <clears throat> and of course, they're also experimenting with GMO meat and even meat for consumption from cloned animals. You know, so just think about the defilement of that or milk from cloned cows, you know, is, is what they're trying to do. So how are GMO seeds made and why are they so dangerous? Now, GMO seeds are engineered by transferring genetic material from one organism into another organism to create specific desired traits. So they'll splice that seed and they'll inject it um, with another trait from another organism, whether from an animal or another seed or another crop. And um, so these seeds are crossbred at the genetic level to produce, in most cases, a seed that is resistant to pesticide sprays. That way you can spray a crop all you want with Roundup, you know, they call it Roundup Ready Seeds, with that pesticides, and you'll kill all the weeds that are growing up around that crop without harming the crop. Okay, but of course, all that pesticide is residually on that crop now. 
Or they even make GMO crops called BT plants, which act as a pesticide itself. So the crop itself becomes the pesticide and releases these toxins into the soil that kills the weeds around it. And then you end up eating that crop that's a pesticide. You know, so you're eating the pesticide itself. Um, and one, day, one way that they create these GMO traits and seeds is that they isolate the traits that they want and they inject the seed with bacteria, okay, that carries, it acts as a carrier uh, from one genetic trait to another and genetically modifies the traits of that other seed. So they're literally injecting seed with bacteria to create GMOs. And that, of course, doesn't that stay in that seed? Um, so it literally is like Frankenstein seeds, the way that they're manipulating all of these you know, techniques to create, to create food. But eventually, what ends up happening is that the pesticides become ineffective. And so what happens is that super weeds will grow up around that crop. And Roundup, which is that original pesticide, then no longer is effective against you know, those weeds, the super weeds. And so farmers are having to spray 10 times the amount of pesticide that they used to spray about 15 years ago. But eventually the pesticides become completely ineffective and just no longer work against the super weeds. So even, even spraying 10 times the amount that they used to is not enough anymore. <clears throat> and, those, and it just becomes ineffective completely. And so the farmer has to resort to a stronger, more dangerous pesticide to react to the super weeds called 2,4-D. And 2,4-D is 50% of the ingredient that Monsanto used in Agent Orange. Okay, so now some farmers are literally spraying their crops with 50% Agent Orange to combat these super weeds. And then we're in, you know, the general public ends up consuming Agent Orange. A 2009 International Journal of Biological Sciences study found that rats who consumed GMO corn for 90 days had severe liver and kidney damage, <clears throat> higher metabolic rates, impaired embryonic development, and also developed mammary tumors. <clears throat> A 2012 scientific study from the Journal of Applied Tox Toxicology also found that GMO foods could affect human tissue at the cellular level when combined with pesticides like Roundup. So these are, you know, the science is there uh, proving that these GMO crops are very um, in effect, are very dangerous. <clears throat> now corn is the number one crop made in the US uh, today. 90% of all corn that's manufactured, that's grown is GMO. Okay, 94% of all soybeans are also GMO. So it's pretty guaranteed that if you go to a restaurant and order soy or corn, that it's GMO, you know, including all that delicious soy sauce at, you know, Chinese restaurants that, that we all like to go to. Um, you know, it's all going to be pretty much going to be GMO. Um, other GMO crops include canola, which is 90% is GMO, cotton, which is also 90%, papaya, 75%, alfalfa, zucchini, squash, and also the majority of all sugars <coughs> are GMO. <clears throat> now, something like 80% of all products on grocery store shelves are also GMO. Uh, you know, not just the produce, but actually whatever is on the shelves, because they all contain some kind of corn a GMO corn byproduct or product uh, like high fructose corn syrup, just as the, the main big example of that. And a lot of these other chemicals that you see listed in the ingredients are also byproducts of GMO corn, like cellulose, saccharin, uh, poly, sorry, not saccharin, but cellulose, polydextrose, and xanthan gum. They're all derived from GMO corn because what's happening is that our government is subsidizing certain crops like corn, alfalfa, you know, so, that, so they're getting money, the farmers are getting money from our government 
to put as much of their efforts into growing corn. And so they're producing more corn than we consume as a society. And so what ends up happening is we'll create other products out of that corn and just distribute it into every other product that we can. So the vast majority of everything on the shelves ends up actually being GMO, even if you don't see corn listed as one of the ingredients. And so that's why a bag of chips made from corn is a lot cheaper. You can get it for a few bucks, you know, for a bag of Doritos versus a head of broccoli, which can end up being a lot more expensive because that corn is being subsidized and unnaturally, you know, the market is not natural. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So the government is actually paying our farmers to grow GMO corn. So not only is our government failing to keep us safe from these foods, but they're actually taxing us and subsidizing GMO foods on top of it. Other GMO in ingredients include amino acids, aspartame, absorbic acid, sodium ascorbate, vitamin C, citric acid, sodium citrate, ethanol, both natural and unnatural flavorings, maltodextrins, monosodium glutamate, sucrose, and most yeast products. So all those things on the labels and the ingredients that you read, that you should be reading, you know, that, you, that don't sound like food are gonna pretty much be GMO um, ingredients. Now, some foods are not GMO. Not every single crop that's out there is GMO because the companies have not yet been successful in producing certain GMO crops. And so they're, you know, to be financially viable, they're concentrating their efforts on the big crops, you know. Um, but eventually, their ultimate goal is to take over and patent the entire world's food supply. So once they, you know, they're going to work up to it. Um, eventually, but if even if some foods today are not GMO, it doesn't mean that they're safe to eat still. Because first of all, they're still sprayed. You know, most crops are still going to be sprayed. And um, one example of why foods aren't safe uh, if they're not organic is the, the tomato. Now, the tomato is not GMO today because they attempted to make a GMO tomato, but they couldn't get the flavor right. And it just, didn't, it just didn't work. So tomatoes are not, there are no GMO tomatoes in production in America today. But when you buy non-organic tomatoes, what ends up happening um, when you get them from the grocery store is that they're picked while they're still green. Okay, and then they, send, they ship them off and they're ripened using ethylene gas. So even that process of ripening the tomatoes that are you know, conventional tomatoes and not organic are gonna have, even though they're not GMO, they're still not safe to consume. Um, and this is kind of the standard among most of the foods that, that we get at the grocery store. And while the USDA, the FDA, and the EPA are supposed to act as our safeguards against corporate greed, these behemoth tax-funded government organizations are instead conspiring with Monsanto and other food conglomerates to deceive the public that they are supposed to serve and to protect. I mean, it's literally, if you look up, if you look into this and research it a little bit, the government is literally in cahoots with these food companies. The USDA is supposed to ensure that our foods are safe to grow. Okay, that's their, that's their primary role. That's why they were funded and created. The FDA, is supposed to ensure that our foods are safe to eat. Okay, so they all have different roles. And the EPA is supposed to ensure that growing food will not harm our environment, you know, with all the pesticides or the cross-contamination between the crops. But in, in every case, they're actually encouraging this rather than fighting against it. And so they're failing at their jobs, and that's by design. And there's what's called a revolving door at these government agencies where executives flip back and forth between Monsanto and government positions. For example, just to name a couple names, Michael Taylor, the FDA's deputy commissioner for policy was previously an attorney for Monsanto. So he's working for the FDA currently, but he was a, an attorney for Monsanto. Now, 
Taylor wrote the FDA's labeling guidelines for bovine growth hormone given to dairy cows. So as an FDA person, he wrote the regulations for, for the bovine growth hormone. Before that, the same man, Michael Taylor, was working as a lawyer for Monsanto, preparing legal work for the same drug, for the same bovine growth hormone, that which he later wrote the legislation for. You know, so it's an obvious conflict of interest. It's obvious corruption at the government and the corporate level, which should be no surprise as we enter into the, head, into the end times. This is the kind of stuff that we have to be aware of. You know, like you were saying, we have to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. We have to be aware of the things that, that are happening around us. Linda, Linda J. Fisher, Assistant Administrator for the EPA's Office of Pollution, Prevention, Pesticides, and, and Toxic Substances, the EPA, is now, she was the EPA, for the EPA, <clears throat> working for the EPA, she is now Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for Monsanto Corporation. So they just go back and forth. Michael A. Friedman, Acting Commissioner of the FDA's Department of Health and Human Services, is now Senior Vice President for Clinical Affairs at one of Monsanto's pharmaceutical divisions. Marcia Hale, former assistant to the White House under President Clinton, now Director of International Government Affairs for Monsanto Corporation. Margaret Miller, Chemical Laboratory Supervisor for Monsanto, now Deputy Director of Human Food and Safety at the FDA. So, and this list just goes on. I've, I only picked out like five names. There's just pages and pages where they're all working uh, for each other. And even former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld and uh, current Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas held former positions at Monsanto. So this, you know, this goes to the very top. Um, this, this cons cons it, has, it is a conspiracy. You, know? you can legitimately say that it's a truthful conspiracy when it comes to Monsanto in our, in our food. So let's talk about two of the main meats that we all eat. Okay, chicken and beef. Now, chicken today grows twice as fast and twice as big as God intended when he created the chicken, at least twice, maybe more. Now, the age of slaughter has dropped from 16 weeks in the 1950s. That's when they would slaughter the chickens for meat. Um, so 16 weeks in the 1950s to only seven weeks today. So it's less than half and they're growing twice as big. And since the breast is the most sought after part of the chicken, the hormones are mainly concentrated into the breast muscles of those chickens. So today's chicken carries seven times more breast than it did 25 years ago. And as a result, the chickens can't hold up their own weight, and so they just wobble on the ground, and then you know, they slaughter them in, at seven weeks and you eat them. Now, think about your children for a minute. You know, this is, where, this is where it gets important. This is when I became aware of this issue. My kids were about, you know, five, four, three, you know, we really started thinking about what they're eating and how important it is to feed them the right foods. So when you think about all the hormones, the growth hormones and steroids that they're putting in that meat, in that chicken meat and in the beef, you know, what does that meat do to your children? So. Children are now showing signs of early puberty as early as six, seven, and eight years old. You know, when it should be like 12, 13, 14 is God's way, is, is the natural order. And so we're seeing this early puberty as a result of all the hormones in our meat, in our milk. And that's a documented fact. And one of those hormones is estrogen. So what do you think that does to men when they're eating this hormone-filled meat, you know, it's, it's, estrogen is a female hormone, and in certain meats, there's also the male hormone, testosterone, which then women consume. So we're seeing this blending of men and genders and, you know, effeminate men and, and masculine women in our culture, partly, I don't think that's the only reason, you know, there's also stuff in our water, there's also, you know, media conditioning, there's a lot going on, but this is one of the factors that we're, we're seeing this begin to happen as well as just the wickedness of, of the people. Um, 
So, you know, we have to be aware of these things. Now, beef is, is the other big meat, you know, that our culture consumes. And God designed cows to eat grass. Okay, that's the way that God designed the cow. And so there's even a, a couple Bible verses about that. Look at Deuteronomy 11:15. It says, "And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full." Psalm 104:14 also says, "He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man." that he may bring forth food out of the earth. So these verses clearly state that God designed cows to eat grass, cattle to eat grass. That's their natural diet. That's a part of God's natural order. Okay, so a cow's digestive system has been designed by God to graze on grass out in the you know, fields or in the prairies and to chew the cud. That's, that's how he designed the cows. But because GMO corn is so cheap, since it's subsidized by the U.S. government, and since it's cheaper to pack as many cows as you can into a cheap, muddy field, rather than to let them graze on rich grasslands and prairies, cows today are being fed GMO corn instead of prairies and grass and wild grasses like they were, like God intended. And so... Because of that, cows are now starting to develop E. coli in their guts. So that's why you see these E. coli outbreaks in, in the meat. You know, you hear about these recalls because they're just packed together, in, you know, ankle deep, ankle deep in mud, and they're eating the wrong foods. So one of them gets uh, E. coli, the others all, all get it. And so what they end up having to do then is to inject the cows again with antibiotics to prevent that or to, you know, even sometimes after the fact. But so, you know, they're getting the wrong food, they're getting more drugs injected into them, they're getting the hormones, the, the antibiotics. And so we're not sick and we don't need antibiotics, you know, in our bodies. And, but we're digesting them anyway through our food. And so what that ends up doing is destroying the, our, our own beneficial bacteria in our guts that helps us to digest food. And then so we start to get sick. You know, because, you know, we can't digest our food anymore the way that we're supposed to properly. And then that also leads to staph infections and MRSA is also created. And if you know about MRSA, it's nasty. I mean, antibiotics, typical antibiotics don't work against it. And it just starts eating away at, at your skin and your flesh. Um, and people actually die from it. So what ends up happening is the super bacteria is created that becomes resistant to the antibiotics, just like the super weeds. It's the same concept. And you can apply this to vaccines, you know, as we're taking the flu shot over and over again, and all these different chemicals that they're, you know, in, that they're injecting children with and people with, it's gonna create super bugs and super flus eventually, and things that are gonna be resistant to our, to our traditional treatments. So, that's why it's important when you go to an organic grocer, you know, I always wondered why, what's the big deal about grass fed? You know, you'd see the signs, it would say grass fed, antibiotics free meat. You know, well, that's why it's important because cows are supposed to be grass fed. That's the natural way. Um, and so that's, that's what you want. Cows that graze on grasses the way that God intended. So, let me just uh, give you a couple examples. I have some foods here. So let's see what we can pull out of my pulpit today. But all of these are, are organic that, that we picked up from the local place here. And I know it's very, you know, it's very expensive, and that's, that's, the, that's the trouble. That's the difficulty with all this. But, you know, <clears throat> this isn't from the regular grocer. You know, you can pretty much figure out what's not good at the regular grocery store. But even when you go to a so-called natural store, you still have to be vigilant and you still have to be aware. So what you really want to look for is the organic label. You know, so if it says organic on there from a trusted source, um, which you know, that says right there, then it's going to be good. And I can look on the back at the ingredients and everything is organic. Organic wheat flour, organic sunflower, organic safflower oil, 
organic cracked rye, organic cracked wheat. So everything on here, because that organic label is there, is going to be God-made foods, clean, you know, as long as they're not lying to you about it, you know. But as of right now, that is the regulation, that is the government regulation, that if that organic is on there, then it's good. So you have, you know, organic pasta, um, organic maple syrup, you know, you want to stay away from the fake maple syrup, which is just GMO corn syrup, basically. Um, organic peanut butter. So these are all the good foods. Organic ketchup, <clears throat> they have high fructose corn syrup in, in your regular ketchup. So you're ingesting GMOs. Now this one I like because it's um, organic crushed tomatoes, but you can't see it here, but it also is lining made without BPA. So BPA is um, another chemical that they put in our plastics in our, in our um, tins, you know, that is another dangerous uh, byproduct. So just things to be aware of. Now, here's an example. I have a Newman's O's, which is like an alternative to Oreo cookies, which the kids, kids love this stuff. But here's the thing. Paul Newman is getting a little bit tricky. So he's, he's a little bit deceptive here. And he's, I like him as an actor, but the thing is, this says... Um, made with, <clears throat> so it's cookies, made with organic flour and organic sugar. So you think, oh, well, their or organic label is there, but it's a little deceptive because it's not saying that the whole thing is organic. It just has organic flour and organic sugar. And when you look back on the ingredients here, there's sodium bicarbonate, which is in, probably a GMO yeast. Um, there's soy lecithin, which is an emulsifier. Um, there's natural flavors, which is GMO. So there's other things. You have to be really vigilant and not get deceived, even at the natural stores. So we're going to throw this one away. Sorry, kids. You know, you're not going to eat this one anymore. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing. Then you have another example is your uh, popcorn. Corn, we know. 90% is GMO, but this is actually a non-GMO. So you have the non-GMO project verified. Um, and so this is non-GMO corn. But here's the, here's the thing, and this is also GMO-free uh, potato strips, okay? But the problem is if that organic label isn't on there, which these don't have, it's still gonna be sprayed most likely, or there could be other ingredients in there. So it's good that it's non-GMO, it's kind of a, you know, it's better than just going to the regular store and getting GMO corn, but it's still going to have pesticides, maybe that Agent Orange on there, you know, I don't know. It might have something crazy on there, <clears throat> and we just, we don't know. And then the last example, I've got some Hatch red enchilada sauce, which just great tasting sauce. Um, we made some really good enchiladas, but there's no, you know, there's no um, organic. It's not, it's probably, it could be GMO. It's probably got chemicals in there, Hy hydrolyzed, what is that? Hydrolyzed corn protein. Okay, that's going to be GMO. So, you know, there's just things that you want to watch out for even when you shop. Now, the issue is I understand that the number one challenge in all this is that organic food is very expensive, you know. Um, but there's a reason for that. You know, first of all, the, the GMO crops are what are driving up the cost of organic pr crops because before everything was already organic. You didn't have, they didn't, farmers didn't have to worry about it. They just planted their seeds and the foods grew. But now that, you know, there's GMO foods and pesticides and all this other stuff, the farmers have to, organic farmers have to go through a very laborious and intensive process just to get certified organic and that costs a lot of money and time. Um, they also have to protect their crops from these invading GMOs and they t have to take technological measures to keep their farm safe so that they won't get cross-contaminated. So all of this drives, drives up the cost of food. And so what's actually happening, it's not that the GMO, or the, it's not that the organic foods are expensive, it's that the GMO foods are, are the real expense that are driving up 
the cost of the organic foods. If, we, if they didn't have to do all that, it wouldn't be so expensive. Um, and you do get, you know, you get what you pay for sometimes, you know. So it's just something that we have to budget and prioritize in our family budgets. You just, you know, make it one of your top priorities to actually, you know, budget for it. And there are certain things that are important and certain things that are not that we can get rid of. In our, in our budgets, you know, and maybe you've already done this, but you can unplug your TV cable. You know, cable alone will cost sometimes $80 a month that you can put towards real food. And it's all junk and all evil anyway, so, you know, why do you want that cable TV? Maybe get rid of your cell phone if you have to and get a traditional landline. And I know some people it's related to their jobs and they can't do that. But, you know, I went through most of the 80s and or all of the 80s and most of the 90s without a cell phone or the internet you know and we had a, we had a great time you know it was it was actually better in in that in that day um, you know you can eat out less you can make you know more home cooked meals and i understand it is hard but just prioritize and make sure that you're feeding your children foods that are clean and that is going to bless them and not not be a danger to them and you know the fact is they're attacking us from all sides from chemtrails in our skies to fluoride in our water to harmful vaccines to our children so we have to stay vigilant and be wise as serpents and God will provide a way God does not want you to eat GMO foods and non-organic food and I know that might seem crazy but it's true because it goes against God's natural order God hates Monsanto the Bible is against GMO foods and God is against us spraying our foods with pesticides it wasn't until after World War II in the 1950s that some farmers began to even use pesticides so before that for 6,000 years you know, God provided food to, to everybody, to all of mankind, without the use of chemicals or GMOs or anything else. So this is actually a very, very recent occurrence in the history of the world. And I believe that's why as, we, as we're leading up into the end times, where there's going to be famine and pestilence, you know, this is all a part of that that's going to eventually potentially lead up to that kind of thing. Now, Psalm 37.25 says, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. So there is a promise from God's word that the righteous, which is God's people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, will not be forsaken nor will our seed be begging for bread. Not even our children will be begging for bread. So God will never allow his people to starve. <clears throat> to starve. We have to you know, trust God and put faith in God that he's going to provide. <clears throat> so, and if anyone thinks I'm, I'm sounding funny because of um, the foods we eat, it's not. As you guys know, I had a cold um, this week, so I'm, I'm uh, trying to keep my voice straight. But let's end with some promises from God's word on how God will feed us and care for us. Psalm 147.9 says, He giveth to the beast his food and to the young ravens which cry. So it's God that feeds us and all the beasts of, of, the, of the earth. If God feeds the beasts and the birds when they cry out to him, how much more will he feed you? Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 6, 26. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, that your, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 9 through 11, Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them, <clears throat> to them that ask him? So God is going to provide. We just have to trust. Because God doesn't want to provide us with poison foods, 
with GMO foods. So if, if it's God's natural order to give us real foods, just put your faith in him. Trust that he's going to open up your budget or prioritize your budget or rearrange your budget to be able to do that. When Jacob blessed Joseph in the Bible, it says in Genesis 48, 5, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. So Jacob acknowledged that it's God that fed him. And so we should expect that God will feed us also as we follow him. Real food that's not been tainted, that hasn't been poisoned, and that is pure. Just like the Bible, you don't want a GMO version of the Bible that's been altered and changed and corrupted like the modern versions. We should expect <clears throat> the same from our food. <clears throat> so don't get the fake altered version of food, just like you wouldn't get you know, an NIV or an NASB, get a KJV, get the real thing. Psalm 111.5 says that God gives meat to those who fear him. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. In Psalm 136.25, the Bible says God gives food to all flesh because of his mercy. Who giveth food to all flesh for his mercy endureth forever. So if it's to all flesh, how much more to us, you know, his own people. Matthew 6, 11, Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. So pray that God will provide any, any will. He's provided us with clean food and it's not through the tithe for any critics out there. Or, you know, he has provided us through hard work and labor the ability to get organic food and he's fed us, you know, for the last, what, 10 years this way, you know, so it's, it's how we're supposed to be eating and just pray and God will multiply your food like he did for the 5,000. Even if he has to do it miraculously, God will do it. So let me just leave you with some really eye-opening documentary, documentary recommendations because there's only so much that I can cover in one sermon. Um, but I highly encourage you to go to YouTube, and I'm not, in a, I'm not associated with any of these documentaries. They didn't ask me to promote them. They don't know that I'm promoting them. But go to YouTube and search. There's five of them that are really good that I've seen. Uh, number one is The World According to Monsanto. Uh, number two is Seeds of Death documentary. There's also Food Inc. Uh, there's also The War on Health by Gary Null, exposing the FDA. And there's also, for, for the water issue, which we didn't really get to cover today, there's fluoride poison on tap. And you can look all these up, and um, I encourage you to do so, and just trust and, and pray that God will provide all that you need. So let's end with prayer, and we'll go and eat some delicious food and, and enjoy. So we thank you, Father. We praise your holy name for uh, knowledge that you've given us from your word and from your spirit, God, that makes it clear to us that we are supposed to, you know, trust you and rely on you and be wise and, you know, to go after this issue in a way that will, will bless us and not harm us. Um, and I know that it's a, it's a step for many and it was a, it was a per, you know, progress, a procession for us to, to, you know, eventually purge out all the different foods, and we have to keep being uh, vigilant to seek you, God. So I just pray that, you know, for your mercy, for your guidance, and that we can be thankful, and we, we praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you for, for your word and your truth. Amen.